Hey guys, this is Pastor George with God's Purpose Ministries. What you're about to see is one of our latest messages called Three Ways of Approaching God. I hope it's a blessing to you. Give it some careful consideration. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We're really trying to increase our subscription base so that we can get monetized and we can continue to preach the gospel worldwide. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much. God bless you as you watch. I really enjoyed the study of the parables. I learned a lot along the way. No matter how long you've been a Christian, don't ever stop learning. Amen. amen. So, uh, so I was on a uh, camping trip with my son uh, a few weeks back, and uh, we went walking across what was a lake that's been dying. <laughs> it's shrinking, and when you look at the map, it's like a mile from where the shoreline used to be to where it is now. And so we said, let's go to the lake. And we're like, where is the lake? Couldn't even see it. It was so far, you couldn't see it. It was around a corner over a hill. So anyway, so we drove from what used to be the shoreline to what's now the shoreline. I was going to call it a shoreline. And then we started walking. And we said, well, there's like an island right there. We can walk there. So we start walking. And it started getting deeper, like the mud. It wasn't even water. It was just mud and thick, thick mud, like where you put your foot in. And then you like go to pull your foot out, and your shoe stays in there. You're like, oh no! You have to stick your foot back down in there and get it back in your shoe. So it was thick, and we finally did make it where we were going, but it wasn't easy. It's so slippery, and so the, the mud was so deep. And it reminded me of a story of a father and son who were going fishing, and they were walking through this deep, slippery mud like this. And he's this is a little child, not like my son. My son is like as big as I am, but um, he's a little child, and he. Uh, he kept slipping in the mud. He kept falling. And his father said, son, do you want me to hold your hand? No, no, no. Not, I got it. I got it. And he kept slipping, kept falling in the mud, just getting all muddy and dirty. Finally, he says, Papa, can I hold your hand? He goes, sure, son. So he, he reaches in, and the son grabs the, fa the father's finger, because he's just a little boy. So he grabs onto the father's finger, and they're walking, and the son keeps slipping, and he keeps slipping, and he keeps slipping. And finally, he says, Papa, maybe you could hold my hand. And the father held his hand, and then he didn't slip anymore. And what we learn from this story is that, you know, that when we're at the end of our strength, well, we can't make it any further. And sometimes you may feel like you can't even hold on to God. Sorry. That when you ask Him, and when you pray, and when you trust that He's, that he's holding on to us, and when you pray with faith and trust that even when you can't hold on to God, or you feel like you can't go any further, that He's holding on to you. And He won't let go. He can hold us and we can't hold ourselves. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. So today, we're going to be talking about three short parables that Jesus taught, found in the book of Luke, chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, turn to your Bible, otherwise you can follow on the screen. Luke, chapter 18. So this is going to be three keys to approaching God. Three different ways that Jesus was teaching that we need to be when we're going to approach God. So everyone say three. Everyone say three. Three. Good. Let me see three fingers. Show me three fingers. Three. Okay, so. So Jesus is reading. Or sharing with a bunch of religious people. And he told them a parable to the effect that they would always pray, that men ought to always pray and not to lose heart. So in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while the judge refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I fear neither God nor respect man, yet because this widow is going to keep on bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she'll not beat me down with her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the, ju what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay any, any longer over them? I tell you, he will give him justice, and he will give it to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find such faith on the earth? 
And he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down from to, the, to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In verse 15, And now they were bringing infants to Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them, meaning his disciples, and he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belong to the kingdom of God. For truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Lord, bless the reading of your word. You may be seated. So like I said, there's three keys to approaching God, right? First, be persistent. Second, be humble. Third, be childlike. So in verse 1, we see that Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Or some versions say, to always pray and not to faint. And he said that in a certain city, in verse 2 and 3, he says, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor man, nor respected man. And there was a desperate widow in the city who kept coming to him saying, Give me justice. Give me legal protection against my adversary. And for a while he refused. He didn't want to hear it. Go away, go away, leave me alone. But then, he said to himself, you know, I don't fear God and I don't respect man, but this widow is going to keep on bothering me. And until I give her justice or some legal protection here against her adversary, she's going to beat me down with her continual coming back to me. And I'm going to be worn out. In fact, the uh, the... Amplified Bible says that she'll be an intolerable annoyance until she wears me out. <laughs> so, then Jesus says, the Lord says, so he stops. He's telling a parable. He stops and he says, hey, are you guys listening? Are you paying attention? Did you hear what the ju unjust judge just said? He's questioning them. I want to make sure that they're following what he's saying. He said, did, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what the unjust judge said? He would... He, because he was being bothered, he would go ahead and give into it. He said, but think about your heavenly Father. He said, he is the just judge. Will he, will he not give justice to his elect? Will he not defend and avenge his chosen ones? Because we're talking about an unjust judge, you're comparing to God. And the unjust judge would give in only because she was just a pain. right? Just because she was going to annoy him to death. So eventually he said, you know what, I don't even want to deal with her anymore. I'm just going to give her what she wants just to get her out of my face. But what about God? God's not like that. Will he, not delay over, will he delay over them? He said, I tell you that he will give justice to them speedily against their adversary. So, just side note here. By the way, who is your adversary? Who is your adversary? Wait, who said their spells? I heard you. That's how you get in trouble. <laughs> uh, it's the adversary. Our adversary is the enemy. Amen? Satan, the devil. He says, he will give us justice and will, will avenge us and will defend us. For we are his elect. We are his chosen ones. So, in 1 Peter 5.8, in case you are not sure who your adversary is, 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober-minded and alert. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know, if you don't know who your enemy is, you're going to die on the wrong battlefield. You're going to die on the wrong battlefield for the wrong reasons and the wrong things. And, to, and not just die, but you know, spend your time, your effort, your energy, your prayers, your everything on the wrong battlefield if you don't know what the battle really is. It's a battle over souls. It's a battle to change lives. It's a battle to spread the gospel. It's a battle against the enemy that will do anything and everything within his power to stop that from happening. So don't die on the wrong battlefield. 
And then Jesus finishes this portion of Scripture. He says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He find, and if you do a study on it, it says, will, it doesn't just say, will He find faith. It says, will He find this kind of persistent faith on the earth? This kind of faith. A persistent faith. So what is Jesus telling us here? The first key, like I said, persistent. Don't give up. In Matthew chapter 7, what did Jesus say? He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. For to him who asks, they receive. He who knocks, it's open. And he who seeks shall find. Have you ever noticed that the first three letters spell ask? Ask, seek, knock. Ask. Ask. Trust. Ask him. Pray. But you know the words in that, in that uh, scripture... It doesn't just mean ask, but it's like a present progressive tense. It means keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and these things will be open unto you. It's like you have to have like a pit bull faith. You ever seen a pit bull when they grab onto something? <laughs> they don't let go. If that thing has your arm or your leg, forget about it. They, they lock. They have literally like a lock in their jaw, and they will lock onto you. And, and even they can't let go. I don't think I've seen people beating them in the face trying to get them to let go, and they won't let go. We need to be that way with our faith, amen? Persistent, tenacious. It's kind of like the story when Jesus was there. He's in this, this house and he's teaching, sharing the word of God, and all of a sudden, these little particles start falling. And was like, "What's going on?" So things are falling in the air, and everyone's standing back. What's going on? And they look up, and there's these guys up on the roof, and they're tearing the roof off of the house. They're tearing the the, the, the hay and the tiles back. They're tearing. They got tile tearing faith. They're tearing back the things because why? Because they had a friend who needed Jesus. And they couldn't get in through the door because it was so many people crowded in there. It was like a line going out the door down the street. They couldn't get in through the door. They couldn't get in through the window. Let's go through the roof. And they're like, let's go. And so they get up on the roof and they're tearing the roof off the place and they lower their friend down with, with I guess, ropes or whatever. But they really came prepared because they somehow or another, like, we got to get our friend to Jesus. I mean, they had ropes. They had whatever it took to tear the roof off. These guys were not playing around. And you know what's funny too is that when, when, Jesus, when they lower the man down in front of all those people, Jesus ends up healing him. He says, your faith has made you whole. And I always think to myself, well, yeah, he had faith, but what about the guys up there that lowered him down? I mean, they, they're the ones with the faith. They're the ones that carried their friend all the way up on the roof and tore the roof off the place and lowered him down before Jesus. They had tile-tearing faith. That's the kind of faith we have to have when we're trying to bring people to Jesus. We've got to have that kind of tenacity, that kind of faithfulness, that kind of faith that says, I'm going to try to get this person to Jesus the best I can. What they do with Christ, what they do with the gospel is their choice. But it's our job to bring them the word. It's our job to bring them before Jesus. It's our job to help them to find the Savior. Now, if they, if they choose to reject him, we all have that option. That is their choice. But we need to bring them to Jesus. Amen? So, but it's not just, we don't just need that kind of faith though when we're praying for things. You know, some people are like, oh God, I'm praying for this job, I'm praying for this, I'm praying for that. That's fine. And we don't just need that kind of faith though when we're praying for people. Um, but we also need that type of faith, that tenacity, when we're praying for answers, when we're praying for direction, when we're praying for wisdom, when we're praying for guidance, when we're praying for God to show me what do I do next, which way do I go next. You have decisions that need to be made in your life, when you're praying for His presence in your life, be tenacious. Don't give up. Be persistent. You know, it reminds me of the time when the blind man was, was brought before Jesus and Jesus prays for him. He says, can you see? And the man says, uh, I see people, but it looks like trees walking around. He wasn't quite healed. He was like partially healed, right? He, like, he was totally blind and now he can see something. People are walking. You see them like shadows, like trees. What did Jesus do? You give up? Well, that's, that's what you got. Well, <laughs> you know, I guess you didn't have enough faith. Walked away. No. Jesus prayed again. Yes, that's right. Even Jesus prayed again. And what happened? The man was healed. Don't give up. Be persistent. Key number one, be persistent. Amen? All right. So, second. So now we got a Pharisee. So the second key is to be humble. And it's funny because in verse 9, he tells us, it's funny because Luke wrote this, and Luke kind of interjected. He's recapping the story, and he interjects, 
Jesus told this part for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. So Jesus didn't say those words. That's, that's Luke recounting this story. And he says, this is what Jesus said to those kind of people, those who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. But the Pharisee, standing off by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. And I give all that I, and I give tithes of all that I have. But this tax collector, standing far off, wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his chest. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be what? Exalted. So look at this Pharisee. First of all, he's standing by himself. So he's like, you know, well, I don't want to stand near that guy, right? Get off by himself. Gets by, you know, I, I need a special place to pray. Be very religious. Stand by, I won't get, you know, don't get your sin on me. I'm like, oh, you, you peasants, you, you know. So he stands off by himself, first of all, which I, th I thought was kind of funny. But he's so self-absorbed. He thinks he's so special and so much better than everybody else. And then he has this false gratitude. He's like, oh God, I thank you that you didn't make me like other people. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm just, I was just, as I'm reading into this, I'm just like, just amazed at this, at this guy. He's so full of himself that he has no room for God. He's so full of himself, he has no room for God. It's like, how do you have room for God in your life? You're so full of yourself. You know, God can't fill your cup if it's already full, right? Can you put anything else in a full cup? It's full. This man was full of himself. So is that you today? Is that me? God help us if that's us, that we are so full of ourselves that God can't even pour into us, that we think we're so special, we're so self-absorbed, everything's about us. Have you ever, ever met people like that? It's, <laughs> I have, <laughs> all the time. And it's very frustrating sometimes how everything in the world is about them. And if you ever forget anything, if you didn't, some opportunity, you could have given them something or could have done something to benefit them, and it's all about them, and they make you feel, try to make you feel bad because you didn't think about them first in every little situation. And man, I, it's, it's just like, I just walk away sometimes shaking my head like, wow. <laughs> it's just speechless. But this man was so full of himself. Proverbs 16:18 uh, says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. See, this man came before God so puffed up with pride. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that it's by grace that we're saved. Amen? It's by grace that we're saved through faith. Not by works. It's not of our own doing, but it's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast and say, oh, I earned this, so oh, I deserve this, I deserve that. There's no righteousness we have of our own, on our own, without Christ. You have no righteousness. I have no righteousness. I do not deserve, I couldn't earn, couldn't deserve, and I'm not worthy of the grace of God. I'm not. But Jesus is funny because he embraced sinners. Sinners flocked to Jesus. In fact, the Pharisees, they always were condemning Jesus because look at him, he's a wine-bibber and a glutton, he's a party animal. He's always got sinners around him. Sinners never come to us. Well, of course they don't. You're so religious. It's like you've been baptized in pickle juice. Who wants to hang around you? A bunch of sour faced, right? You don't have anything that, the, that they would want. You're all sour and everything else. So, of course, people don't come to hang around you. You're not winning anybody over to your cause. But Jesus wasn't that way. But why? Why did Jesus embrace the sinners, the outcasts, the lonely, the abandoned, the lowest, the least, the lost, the ones that nobody else wanted to be around, the rejected? Why? Because they sought Jesus out. And they knew they were sinners. And they were just honest. They didn't have to pretend that they didn't need God like the Pharisees were. Right? What did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come to heal those that, don't, that aren't sick, or at least don't think they are. I came to heal those who need a doctor. Those who know that they're sick. And so, they were humble, not self-righteous. 
And I'm reminded of the story of the, the woman with the alabaster box who comes to Jesus. So here's Jesus. He's been invited over to a feast, right? And he's at this man, Simon. He's a Pharisee. He's at his house with all these Pharisees. And they're all kicking back, doing whatever Pharisees do, right? Probably talking smack about Jesus. <laughs> and he's there, and they're just probably watching him, waiting for him to do something they could blame him for, right? And then this woman comes in. Wasn't invited. She comes walking right in the midst of them. And she was a harlot. And she comes in, and she, starts, she bows down before Jesus, and she's crying on his feet. And then she takes her hair, and she starts to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she takes this very, very valuable alabaster box, like a jar of ointment, and she cracks it and breaks it and pours that out on his feet and anoints his feet. And the Pharisees sit back and they judge. Look at this guy, Jesus. He's not a prophet. If he knew what kind of woman this was that was touching him, he wouldn't let her even near him. So they began to judge not only Jesus, but this woman. Jesus knew. And it's the funniest thing about that story, something that I... I get from that story is that it's funny how in a room full of religious people, this woman, a sinner, can walk in and can touch the heart of God. In the midst of a bunch of religious people, she bowed down and she found a place of worship while they sat around and just judged everybody. A sinner, a harlot, an outcast, somebody that they wouldn't give the time of day to, somebody they probably had, they been more, they might have grabbed her and thrown her out before she even had a chance to do that because she wasn't welcome, she wasn't invited, but she found the presence of God. Now let's look at this tax collector. What is he? What's his attitude? He's humble, repentant, he's honest, he's hungry for God, he's crying out to God, not judging others, he's surrendered. Hmm, he sounds like a Christian. Could be. He sounds like a Christian. Hmm. Humble, repentant, honest, transparent, hungering for God, crying out to God, not judging others, but just somebody who's just surrendered. So is that you today? Is that you? Is that me? Is that who we are before God? Are we hungering for God? Are we humble before God? Realizing that we don't earn it, we can't deserve it. It's only by His grace that we're saved. Hmm. You know, what makes me a Christian isn't that I wear a cross on my head. That's not what makes me a Christian. What makes me a Christian isn't that I carry around a Bible. And I read my Bible. I probably have about 15 Bibles in different rooms in my house. But that doesn't make me a Christian. The fact that I pay my tithes to our ministry and to this church, that doesn't make me a Christian. Mormons pay their tithes. They're not Christian. Yeah, I said it. It's true. They're not. That's not what makes me a Christian. The fact that I share my faith, the fact that I'm involved in a ministry, that's, you know, the fact that I am an ordained pastor, certificate, big whoop de doo that doesn't make me a Christian. Maybe you do some of those same things. That's not what makes us Christians. What makes us Christians is that we are surrendered to God, that we've repented of our sin, that we've asked Him to forgive us. It's very simple. That's what makes us a Christian. It's not that we come to church. I've said it before. You can come to church every single day of your life. That doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than going to McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. Right? You can go to McDonald's seven days a week. You can live in McDonald's. You're not a cheeseburger. You might start to look like a cheeseburger. You know what they say, you are what you eat, right? You eat fat, greasy food, you're going to be a fat, greasy dude. That's just all there is to it. But you can sit up in church your whole life. It doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you a churchgoer, maybe. But a Christian is somebody who is just all these same things that this man, as he came before God, and he humbled himself. He didn't even, couldn't even look up, to, wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven. He just, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. And he was just honest. And he just needed God. He just cried out for God. 
See, that's what makes us a Christian. And you know, if I was in this parable, if I was in the story Jesus is telling, I like could just like beam into this story and be in the temple right there, and I'm looking at these two guys, I've got a Pharisee over there off by himself, all pompous and self-righteous. And I think you God that I'm not like that guy over there. And I'm not like other men. I'm not a thief and a liar and blah, blah, blah. I'm not this and I'm not that all puffed up. And this guy was crying out to God, pouring his heart out before God. If I was standing in the temple and I'm watching these guys, I'd say, hmm. I think I want what that guy has. Who is his God? Because the God he serves isn't afraid of him being honest. Isn't afraid of him pouring out his heart. Isn't afraid of him crying out to his God. This man is humbled. And this man, I don't know if he even knows God. And if he does, whatever God he's serving, I don't want anything to do with that God. Pompous and prideful. This man pretended to be something he was not. Because as much as he went on and on about all the things that he did, what you do and what you are can be two different things. This man was going on and on about, I pay my tithes and I do this and I do that. It's funny, but Jesus (laughs) talks about in the end times how one day people will stand before him and they'll come before God and they'll say, but Lord, didn't I do all these great things in your name? Didn't I, I cast out demons in your name? I did this in your name and that in your name. And the Lord's going to say, I don't even know you. Who are you? The works you did were unauthorized. I don't even, I don't even know who you are. You called me Lord with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. I don't even know you. God help us not to be like that. So key number one, Recap, what was it? What was it? Yes, tenacious, persistent. Be persistent. Key number two, be, starts with an H. Humble, good. And number three, be childlike. So now, you got got his disciples there, think they got to be a bodyguard and protect Jesus against little kids. (laughs) So they're bringing infants. These mothers are bringing infants and young children so they might be touched and blessed by Jesus. And the disciples are like, oh, and they start rebuking them. Ah, get your kids, get out of here. He doesn't have time for you guys. Leave the master alone. And Jesus rebukes them, stops them and says, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For, these, for such as these belong to the kingdom of God. For truly I say to you that if you don't receive the kingdom of God like these little children, you won't even enter into it. So, what's, so what was Jesus saying? See, there's childlike, right? Then there's childish. There's a difference. You know the difference? You can probably imagine, right? You've seen you've seen people that are childish, I'm sure I'm sure. <laughs> but childlike is trusting, right? So you're, does, when your child comes to you, are they coming to you because they tr- they trust, right? I mean, you're their parent. They trust you that, that you're gonna do the right thing. It's trusting that. He can and He will answer. When it comes to God, when we come to God, we trust God. We're trusting that He can and that He will answer. We trust that He cares. Amen? We trust that He cares. Do you trust that He cares? Okay. No? Yeah? Do you know that God cares about you? Maybe we have to stop. Oh, stop everything. Stop the tape. No. <laughs> you know that God cares about you, right? Maybe we should have started with that. <laughs> Rewind. God cares about you. Every single aspect of your life, He cares. You know, when Jesus was on the boat with His disciples and He was asleep, and he's on. And, and Luke, it's funny, Luke even mentions he's got his head on a pillow, right? So he's asleep with his head on a pillow. I don't know why I had to make that point, but he was just knocked out, right? And they come down to Jesus to wake Him up. And they say, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? It's the most insulting thing they could have said to Jesus. Because they didn't, they didn't doubt his ability. Because if they doubted his ability, they wouldn't have gone to wake him up. They would have just drowned, or they would have just let the waves crash over the boat. But they, they knew, and they weren't, they weren't exaggerating, by the way. That was a serious storm. These were fishermen. They knew if the boat was going down, and the boat was going down. So they weren't exaggerating the problem. But they go to Jesus, and they wake him up. Don't you care? Every time I read that, I'm like, man, <laughs> it just breaks my heart. Because I can be that way, too. When we don't 
think that God is answering our prayers, we think that God doesn't care. We doubt his care for us. Why did he leave heaven in the first place? Here he is on a boat with you bunch of knuckleheads, you know, tax collector, fisherman, the worst of the worst, right? The people that nobody else wanted to hang out with. Jesus said, I'll make you my disciples. They're like, really? Me? Okay. He gathers up these guys. They're on a boat. And then they challenge that he doesn't even care about them. He doesn't have to be here on the earth at all. He could have stayed up in heaven on, in, in glory on his throne. But no, he left all that to come here. And they have the nerve to say, don't you even care that we're dying? God cares. So being childlike means trusting, trusting that, that he can and that he will answer, that he cares, and also that he knows what's best for us. Amen? He knows what's best for us. You know the story when Jesus was talking about the men, uh, when he's talking about the father, who he says, your father in heaven is a good father. So you as men, you even know what it means to be a good father. When your son comes and asks you for a loaf of bread, you don't give him a rock to eat, right? You're chewing on a rock. <laughs> Imagine giving your son a rock or a daughter a rock to chew on. Here, chew on that. <laughs> Break their teeth out. He says, you're a, good, you're, you're a human father and you know how to give good gifts. Don't you think your father in heaven knows? So he knows what's best for us. Being childish is demanding our way. Saying, God, I'm praying to you and I'm asking for you to do this. And you better do it. We can be that way sometimes. Come on, be honest. You better do it, God. If you don't do it, then I'm out of here. If you don't give me what I'm praying for, you don't give me what I want, I'm leaving. I don't have to come to this church. I'm leaving. Stomp our feet at God. And God's like, oh. <laughs> God help us. But He is a good Father. Amen? So let's recap. Say three. You guys still awake? Say three. When approaching God, there's three things that we should be. We should be persistent, humble, childlike. Amen. So the most important, I think, prayer that you can ever pray is a prayer of repentance, a prayer of surrender, a prayer where you're giving your heart over to the Lord. So maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I, um, I understand what you're saying, but I mean, I don't even really know this Jesus that you're talking about. I've never truly surrendered like this man. Remember the, the tax collector, right? He was humble before God. He said what? He said, I'm a sinner. He said, I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me. Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. Maybe you've never admitted you were wrong, that you're a sinner. I was wrong for a long time. I live my life on my own terms, doing my own thing, and I don't even want to get into <laughs> the long list of things that I got involved in. But I was far from God, resisting God, even though I knew about God. I was raised in church when I was little. I knew the story of Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark and the garden. I knew the basic Bible story and Jesus dying on the cross. It wasn't like I never heard it. I heard it. But I wasn't accepting it. And I wasn't living it. But one day I finally surrendered. And you know why? It was because I was in this church. And yeah, it was a crazy church compared to this church. For sure, it was a crazy church compared to any church, I guess. But people are jumping, shouting, praising God, falling on the floor, rolling up and down the aisles, the drummer and the guitars and the, the piano and the organ, going crazy, people, people worshiping, jumping around. And, I mean, people see me worship, they think I'm crazy. I'm like, I'd be like half dead compared to these people. <laughs> They're like, wake up. <laughs> but anyway, so all this commotion is going on, and I look across the aisle. I'm in the back row. I always stayed in the back row because the exit was right there. In case things got crazy, I had to get out. <laughs> And they got pretty crazy. So I'm sitting there, and I look across the aisle, and there's this little old lady, gray hair, her head tilted back, her hands raised, and crying. And just, I see the tears rolling back into her gray hair and down her cheek. And I look over at her, and I said, man, I don't know what she has, but whatever she has, I want that. I had a hunger for God. I had a hunger for whatever she had. She had such a peace, something real. I had a lot of junk. 
a lot of stuff. My life was full, but I wasn't fulfilled. I was still empty, and I needed God. And I asked God, what is it that she has? A personal relationship with him. She was forgiven. She was free. And she had peace. And you can have that today, too. So let's all bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful, Lord God, that you continue to be patient with us, Lord. We're grateful for these parables, Lord God, these stories that you have shared with us in your word, Lord, to allow us to learn more about the kingdom of God and how we can get there. And Lord, today, through these parables, we learn how we can approach you when we are simply willing to come to you, Lord, persistent, Lord, not giving up, not putting our faith in other things, but putting our faith in you. But when we come to you, Lord God, and we're persistent, Lord God, and when we're humble before you, and when we come to you childlike, Lord, in faith, just trusting you, we thank you, Lord. So if you're here today with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around for just a moment. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to lead you through a prayer. And you can all pray along. You may be a Christian here today and you've already done this. You've already received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I'd just like to invite you to pray along as well. So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus today, you've never done this before, and I'd just like to invite you to join in from your heart. And just repeat these words. Say, Father. Repeat these words. Say, Father. I come to you today as a sinner. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for all my sins. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I open my heart to you today. Change my heart, O oh God. Give me a new heart. Forgive me for my sins. Give me a new mind. And help me, Lord, to serve you every day. From this day forward, all the days of my life. I love you, Lord. And I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor George Williams with God's Purpose Ministries once again. We hope you enjoyed that message, Three Ways of Approaching God. Just remember to stay humble. Don't be like the Pharisees, prideful and self-righteous, but come to God humble and broken, and He will hear your prayers, and you will be justified and forgiven of all your sins. So we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe on our channel. And do me a favor, share the video with someone that you love and care about. And uh, take a moment to just leave a little comment. That'd be great. We really appreciate it. We appreciate you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.